Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. host for today on this wonderful Wednesday. We are in like, I don't know what week of (laughs) COVID stuff. Uh, I've finally reached the point where every single day kind of feels like the same day over and over again, which is a sci-fi trope in itself. Um, Don't worry, we're not talking about Groundhog Day today, or I'm not talking about Groundhog Day today. I think it's funny that I always say uh, we're as if there's another host on this show, but like it's just me uh, blathering on and on about things that I like that are at least somewhat remotely related to science fiction. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, it's just been weird, and I'm sure that everybody's experiencing that. So today, the topic of our podcast is going to be another sad movie. Um, well, I guess you could call it sad. I don't know. It depends on what your opinion of movies are. Last Sunday, we talked about Hyperion. And we kind of mentioned this idea of immortality. And so I remembered this movie that I had watched that it's not your traditional science fiction movie in the same way that like Her isn't a traditional science fiction movie, but it's decidedly dystopian. Uh, This movie is called The Lobster. It's directed by uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, or Jorgen Lanthimos. He's a a Greek gentleman. He has a few films. Uh, His other film, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, is also on Netflix, and I recommend that one as well. Um, And before we get into talking about the movie and what it's saying and, and all of those things, I wanted to mention a couple of recommendations that I have at the top of the podcast for content for you guys to kind of look into that we'll probably be talking about next Wednesday because on Sunday we're going to do a part two with Hyperion. We'll talk about the next chapter, which hopefully will be one person's story. Um, I haven't been listening to it much, so I don't know where the next chapter goes. I wouldn't be surprised if he has like this kind of in between thing where he establishes a main character a little bit more and then tells another tale. Um, I'm hoping that it's just each chapter is one person's tale of, of Hyperion, but we'll find out. So, That will be Sunday's podcast, but next Wednesday we'll probably be talking about one of these movies that I'm recommending now. Uh, So if you get a chance to watch it, then or watch either one or both, then you could be the beneficiary of getting to listen to me talk about a movie that you watched already, and we could, you know, have the opportunity to exchange some thoughts. So, uh, which I would really appreciate. I've been trying to look into getting an email address or something uh, for people to send questions into, just to check and see how much people are engaging with the content. So be on the lookout, well, be on the listen out for that, I guess, for lack of a better word. Uh, (laughs) So the recommendations that I have uh, for next week, uh, there's a movie called Pi that is on Amazon, and it's about a mathematician who finds an algorithm that allows for a complete and total understanding of like predicting things in the world and how things operate. And that one looks really interesting. Don't know the director and things off the top of my head. If I watch it, then we, when we talk about it on Wednesday next week, then we'll mention that. Um, apparently they're making a Snowpiercer TV show. No idea when that comes out, but it sounds really cool. So I'll probably make mention of that next week. We'll get into some more details with that. And then there's another movie on Netflix called Discovery, I want to say, where essentially, uh, someone confirms the existence of the afterlife. So it's kind of more along the same veins of what we're going to be talking about today. Might do a compare and contrast between that and uh, the the movie that we're talking about today, which is The Lobster. So, yeah, check out Pi on Amazon Prime or the Netflix original uh, Discovery. 
And on that note, we are going to get right into the movie that we're talking about this week, which is The Lobster. So I'm going to give you guys a quick synopsis like I normally do, and then we'll get into a discussion of what I think makes this science fiction, why I wanted to talk about it, and all of those cool things. So the basic synopsis of The Lobster, uh, it came out in 2015. It is co-written and co-produced by Yorgos Lanthimos, C.C. Dempsey, Ed Guinea, and Lee Majaday. Also co-written by Ephthemus Filippo. Uh, I imagine that Ephthemus is probably a co-writer on a lot of projects that uh, Yorgos does. He's... He's kind of like a Tim Burton in that he's got a very unique style that uh, reuses or recycles a lot of cinematography and actors as well. I think both of his films on Netflix, The Lobster, and actually I know both of his films the Netflix on Netflix, The Lobster and The Killing of a Sacred Deer, both star Colin Farrell. So, uh, yeah, just something to be aware of, I guess. It's listed as a absurdist dystopian black comedy, and that's why I feel justified in talking about it on this podcast as a science fiction piece, because it is dystopian, and dystopia inherently implies future. And there are some futuristic aspects to the film. I feel like if they had had a larger budget, they may have made it more science fiction-y, but they definitely do a good job of portraying this as being a dystopia. The... There's a particular scene where they travel to the city, and the city is very, like, clean and kind of it feels near future-ish. And then the concept of the film as well implies a certain type of future, and uh, I'm definitely going to be discussing that type of future. So the film premise is basically single people are given 45 days to find a romantic partner or otherwise be turned into animals. It stars Colin Farrell as a single man trying to find someone so he can remain human. And then another individual as a woman who's also looking for a relationship, so they attempt to form one together. So the the woman who is... The woman who is his... Colin Farrell's romantic interest is not introduced necessarily at the beginning of the film. The film is definitely divided into, like, two acts... And I'm going to be giving away, like, most of the plot and things as usual. So uh, if you wanted to, you know, pause this podcast and listen to another episode of a GSMC podcast so you can have some time to watch the movie before you come back, cool. I don't think that any of the spoilers in this movie really take away from the overall effect of it. So I would recommend, uh, you know, if you haven't seen the movie, just go ahead and listen through the podcast. You'll probably still want to see it by the end of it. I think it's really, really good. So, at the beginning of the film, we find out that David, uh, the main character, Colin, Colin Farrell's character, David has been, his wife has left him to be with another man. So, he is sent to this hotel where they send single people to partner up with each other in order to solicit couples. And one of the big things in the movie that they make very apparent is that only couples are allowed to live in the city. And individuals who cannot be coupled up with another person are turned into animals. Now, I was going to save this plot twist thing concept that I have for the end of the podcast, but I'm just going to talk about it now since we're kind of on the subject. I don't think that anybody in this film is actually turned into an animal in any capacity. I am very staunchly in the camp of thinking that there, because this is a dystopian film, we just don't get a lot of background on what exactly it is that's going on in this particular setting. So just as an example or just to kind of experiment with a couple of ideas that might be implied in the movie, I think that there, because this is a dystopian future, there has been a decision made by the powers that be in this setting that there needs to be some form of population control that is going to solicit a more successful experience for the human race on the planet, or at least in this geographic location. And they are running out of resources to take care of all the people who are populating the cities. And so they have to find a place from which to gather those resources. 
specifically at the beginning of the film, uh, John C. Riley is in this movie, which I think is great. Um, Colin Farrell, John C. Riley, and another actor who I don't know off the top of my head. There's three kind of like two other char- two other male characters who kind of serve as like friends or uh, individuals that Colin Farrell interacts with frequently. Uh, they're having a discussion about like, oh, well, I know about the process of being turned into an animal, and basically this is what happens. And they say, well, this is what they do with the extra parts. You know, they donate the extra blood to this place. They give the limbs to these places. The organs that don't get transferred get sent to here. I think the implication of that interaction is that they're not really turning anybody into an animal. There's some sort of maybe like cloning device or other science fiction thing that produces an animal from the the process of harvesting someone's body for resources. So I think that that's kind of like the basics of it. So I'm going to explore that um, conspiracy theory a little bit more right after this quick commercial break. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco, ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. that individuals in this movie are not actually turned into animals and I was just kind of mentioning what kind of world could potentially solicit such a thing so my theory is that in this movie there is a population issue in uh, on the particular continent that these individuals are on uh, at least in the setting uh, that we are in maybe not in the whole world we don't get a bunch of information about the world outside of this so my theory is that there's an overpopulation issue and a lack of resources in order to take care of individuals who are in a certain class, um, and that class division is between single people and married people or couples, uh, as is listed. So 
those are kind of like our two basic it's a basic dichotomy of society where there's it's kind of like a hierarchical group of course it's a very simple caste a system and so the element of science fiction comes in the alien ideas that are presented to certain individuals as well as the fact that this is a dystopia so in this dystopia they lack the resources to care for individuals who are able to reproduce because they have been they've found a suitable partner and uh, so they harvest those resources from individuals who cannot find partners and therefore don't represent or aren't able to provide as much value to the world it could also be a like just a population control issue as well. Uh, just it's some form of totalitarian government that solicits the need to eliminate individuals who cannot provide a certain, uh, I guess resource would be lack of a better word, but basically they as individuals cannot contribute to society in the way in which society has decided that it, they can provide value. And individuals provide value in their ability to be in couples and reproduce. So Colin Farrell has found himself in the camp of being single. So now he is in the position of potentially having his humanity taken from him. And why would they tell people that they turn them into animals? Well, I think that this is an excellent commentary on religion in the same way that Hyperion commented on religion by saying, or by referencing Nietzsche, I think that the lobster is probably doing something similar, where if you know what's going to happen to you, quote unquote, after you die, there is some form of eternality that is available to you, because once this life is over, you enter into a new life. And how ridiculous is it that you get to be turned into an animal of your choice? And we see lots of animals throughout the film that are, you know, you're supposed to hypothesize our people because they're not in their natural habitat. There's like a truffle pig, there's a Bactrian camel, there's a Shetland pony, and all these things live in this like one forest that uh, you are introduced to as the film kind of gets rolling. So as the film starts, Colin Farrell is taken to this hotel. You find out that there is a group of individuals who are living near the hotel on the in the outskirts of the city. They're living in the forest, basically, and they are called loners. And those are basically people who refused to be turned into animals at the hotel, so they ran away from the hotel to form a colony in the forest. Those loners are hunted by individuals in the hotel and then turned into animals after being captured. They're hunted by... Uh, using tranquilizer guns. And that is another big reason why I don't think anyone has actually turned into an animal in this film, because ultimately if you're capturing individuals and then turning them into animals as a regular process, and then anybody who captures a loner gets an extra day at the hotel. If you're doing that, then what that says to me is that you are just basically harvesting individuals as a resource because you're not killing them. You're using them as a resource. You're taking their blood, you're taking their organs, and you're giving it to places that need it. So I think that it's really interesting that they include that element. Of course, it's intrinsic to the plot later on. So, but you find out that that is part of the process. They call it the hunt. And I don't, they don't say exactly how often it occurs, but that you go out as a group and you hunt for loners and you bring them back and they turn the loners into animals, quote unquote, and then for each loner that you get, you get an extra day at the hotel. So, but getting back onto topic, uh, the this idea, this Nietzschean idea of having eternality after uh, after death, um, that when we talked about it in Hyperion, it kind of intrinsically strips life of meaning in a very specific way. And in Hyperion, it strips them of individuality. And... Also of humanity, but I think the main focus is on this idea of the individual in Hyperion. In The Lobster, knowing what happens to you when you quote-unquote die or lose your humanity is not that you lose yourself as an individual. It's literally this idea that you lose your, your human self. Uh, though they say that in some capacity you keep your human self along with you. So for instance, Colin Farrell's character has a dog with him that he claims is his brother. 
Um, and they do make a joke that a lot of people want to be turned into dogs, which I think is hilarious. But regardless, uh, also, there's a scene specifically involving dogs towards the end of the movie that also makes me feel inclined to think that nobody gets turned into an animal. There's also a specific interaction that one of Colin Farrell's good friends has with wolves. So he, one of Colin Farrell's good friends at the hotel has a limp because as a child, he broke into a zoo enclosure to try and say hi to his mother, who he knew was turned into a wolf because his father left his mother. And so she became single, couldn't find another lover and was turned into a wolf. And, He goes into the enclosure to try and say hi to her because he wants to hug her. And the wolves attack him. Well, if you had any semblance of humanity as an animal, then you would not do that. Pretty obviously. Because they say that you get to keep, like, your brain and your eyes and your heart. Like, that there are specific things that you get to keep as an animal that you know, help retain some sense of self. And like, if, (laughs) if you're a wolf with a human brain, you're not going to attack a little kid who came into your enclosure. So that's yet another implication in the film where I don't believe that people are actually being turned into animals. I think that they're just being harvested for organ parts. Hence why this is the topic of discussion, because this is very clearly a science fiction dystopian film. So because you have this idea of, uh, you're not going to die a real death. You're going to turn into, be turned into an animal and get, essentially get a new lease on life if you can't accomplish this task. What you lose is your humanity, the ability to be empathetic, the ability to actually love somebody, because now you are facing certain death, certain a certain kind of death for not finding someone to couple up with. And in addition to that, because you're not finding someone specific to couple up with in order to achieve relevance or to not be turned into an animal, you lose your humanity out of fear of being turned into that other thing, but also because you know what will happen to you after you fail at this task, the way that you look at this task is intrinsically changed. So... I think one of the most interesting parts about this film and what makes it something that I really enjoyed is the thing that Lanthimos makes the alien knowledge, the new knowledge in this film that turns people from being insiders to outsiders, from being not enlightened to enlightened. And I'm going to talk about that right after this next quick commercial break. I want to talk to you guys about this amazing product I've been using lately called Hydrant. If you're like me and you want to kick the coffee habit, but you're worried about your energy levels depleting to avoid the morning sluggishness and that midday slump, you need to make sure you're hydrated. It's super important. And that's where I've been using Hydrant. And for 25% off your first order, you can go to drinkhydrant.com and enter promo code GSMC at checkout. Hydrant is basically flavored electrolyte packets you mix directly into your water to make hydrating your body easy and delicious. And what I love about Hydrant, it's backed by research. The formula was developed by Oxford scientists to provide perfectly balanced, efficient hydration. Again, that's drinkhydrant.com and enter promo code GSMC for 25% off your first order. Another really cool thing about Hydrant, there's no synthetic colors or artificial sweeteners. The formula is vegan and you can choose between three different flavors or a variety pack. So for all my vegan friendly fellows out there, this one's for you. Again, this is drinkhydrant.com and enter promo code GSMC. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
<laughs> From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. <laughs> Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. What it is that I think is the alien knowledge or the new knowledge that is presented in this film that really lands it straight into the camp of science fiction, uh, aside from the dystopian overtones and undertones. And that alien knowledge is the knowledge of love. So this is part of why I love this film so much. (laughs) Because individuals are aware of what happens to them after death. They are no longer attached to this idea of unconditional love. Every single interaction that individuals have in this movie is decidedly transactional. And honestly, the first time I watched this movie, it really messed me up. Because I started viewing every interaction that I had with somebody as being transactional. And the dialogue and the way in which things are portrayed is so profoundly apathetic and so profoundly mono like monotone in its delivery that you don't really see any emotion in the film until almost halfway through it you don't really experience any sadness from Colin Farrell's character David at the fact that his wife left him it just is uh there's no human element to that the first time that we see a human element is when Colin Farrell has specifically interacted with a woman who is, uh, you know, she has no, she's, she's supposedly is a psychopath. Um, so she has no emotion. They call her heartless. And so she is an incredibly efficient hunter of loners. They show her committing some pretty traumatic acts of violence and things like that. So it's very clear that she is she's just not a good person and Colin Farrell decides that she'll be the easiest person to get with and one of the main trends that you kind of notice in the film pretty quickly is that mutual suffering is the thing that bonds two people together so the gentleman who had his leg gnawed on by a bunch of wolves as a child his previous wife also had a limp And so he is definitely looking for somebody who also has a limp. He ends up partnering up with someone who gets frequent nosebleeds because he fakes having frequent nosebleeds. And the basis for pairing up with somebody is, oh, hey, I also experience this really awful thing on a regular basis. And so that is a a synthetic form of transactional love of like, oh, we both have this very basic thing in common. We both suffer in the same way, so we should partner up. Um, And the only individuals who don't seem to fall into that category are a couple. They are the mother and father of the woman who is in charge of the colony of loners that Colin Farrell joins about halfway through the movie. But that's after this particular instance. So Colin Farrell finds this psychopath woman, decides that he is going to fake it until he makes it with her. So he has to pretend that he also has no feelings and does not value human life in any capacity the same way that she does not value human life in any capacity and lacks emotions. And we start seeing him showing a little bit of emotion and caving into this lie um, during the scene where they're having intercourse with each other and she starts to notice that he is becoming invested in the act in a way that might indicate something more than just the act of intercourse. And so she responds by really testing his 
capacity for not having any emotion by doing something to the dog that Farrell believes is his brother. And that is really the first sign of emotion that we get from Colin Farrell. And from this point on, we start to notice like a, a decided difference in Colin Farrell as an individual. And I think this might be kind of like another thing that is alien in this world, another bit of knowledge that would be considered alien, is emotions themselves are alien in this world. So to have knowledge of them, to acknowledge them, to even have them, is something that grants you insight into the world and into the way in which humans interact with each other because virtually every other interaction is just explicitly transactional. Do you experience this? Yes, I also experience this. Oh, we are suited. We will do this thing together. Um, and the fact that Farrell becomes an alien in among the his peers at the hotel very quickly because of his act of having emotion with this woman he's forced to run away into the forest and join the loners and when he jones joins the loners he already seems a little bit alien compared to them as well and he's definitely a new member of the group so he's already by default an alien in this world of of loners and he immediately finds himself becoming attracted to another individual in the group of loners. But the interesting thing about the loners is that they have the same level of restriction in their interactions with each other, but in the opposite direction of what society normally has. So where society says you're only valuable as a couple, the loners say you're only valuable as an individual. You should, you're not allowed to flirt with anybody else who's in this colony of loners you're not allowed to engage with them romantically, and if you do, you'll be punished harshly with bodily harm. Um, they talk about this idea of the red kiss where pe two individuals have razor blades implanted into their, not implanted, but shoved into their lips, and then they're forced to quote-unquote kiss another person who also has razor blades shoved into their lips. So... Yeah, and they also apparently have something called the Red Intercourse, which is probably the same thing, but uh, you can kind of gather the um, the implications from there. <laughs> so uh, they are decidedly against this idea of pairing up. But because Farrell has this knowledge of emotional attachment, this knowledge of love in some capacity for his brother, he is already alien when he joins this group of people. And he develop, starts to develop feelings for a woman because, and she for him as well, because she saves him from being uh, shot and taken and turned into an animal by John C. Riley. So when she saves him, she says, I would like you to give me this. Don't tell anyone that I saved you because the loners are not allowed to do that for each other. They dig their own graves because if something bad happens to them and they die, they're supposed to crawl into their grave and bury themselves and die alone. And Farrell is trying to exist in this world as an individual, and ultimately he ends up becoming the alien because he has true and real emotions for this woman who also has true and real emotions for him, so she also becomes alien. And... The reason that I brought this up originally was because there is only really one other couple that seems to not be paired up, or that seems to be paired up because they genuinely like each other at first, not simply because they had a qualifying factor that contributed to their partnership. And that those partners are the parents of the woman who is in charge or the leader of the loners. So the leader of the loners' parents live in the city because they're a couple, obviously. And so the loners will fake pair up and travel as two couples to the city in order to get resources for themselves, resources for other things. And they will visit the leader of the loners' parents. And the leader of the loners' parents, or the leader of the loners, will pretend that she has a husband and she's partnered up and can't stay because she has to go back to work. But her parents. There's no mention of why it is that they were paired up with each other. There's no mention of a mutual suffering between the two of them. The only thing that we see between the two of them, the shared experience that seems to be the thing that drew them together, is that they both play guitar beautifully, classical guitar. So they as individuals 
are also alien because they have a knowledge of what it is like to be paired with someone based off of the fact that you have something good in common with them. Whereas literally every other person who pairs up in the movie, they do it based off of something that they both experience suffering with. And I think that that is a profound commentary in itself on relationships that Lanthimos is making. But we're going to talk more about that as well as some other things about the movie right after this next quick quick commercial break. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blank and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Causing individuals to become the or to serve the function of being alien. And I was specifically talking about the couple or the parents of the leader of the loners and how they had paired up based off of a mutual interest and not off of mutual suffering the same way that everybody else had. And so ultimately, I think that they serve as kind of a mechanism to. Not necessarily comment on what makes a healthy relationship, because I don't think that Lanthimos is interested in telling us what he thinks makes a healthy relationship in this film. It's more of a comment on what is it exactly that makes people, quote-unquote, fall in love or become emotionally invested in each other. And I think what he is trying to say is that ultimately pretty much everything that you do in life is going to fall short of your ability to fulfill the expectations of other individuals in transactional interactions. So when you have a transactional interaction with another individual, there's an expectation that is established in that interaction. I expect to give you this thing and to receive this thing from you in return. And when you do that in love, with another individual, when you're in a partnership with someone and that is the way in which you interact with them, you're going to ultimately end up in this place of toxicity because 
you're not truly communicating your needs with the other individual. You're not actualizing any part of you as an individual. So in the same way that Hyperion was commenting on this idea that if you have an afterlife, you don't have an individual, Lanthimos is commenting on this idea if you don't have a self, then you don't have an individual. You have this perception of what it is that you're supposed to do, this perception of how it is that you're supposed to act, and this perception of who you are that is relevant or relative to other people's interactions with you and not your interactions with yourself. And when you're not interacting consciously with yourself, then how is it that you can be expected to actualize any form of that self? So because Colin Farrell is basically playing by the rules of these two different extremist groups of one being you have to be a couple, the other being you have to be an individual, he doesn't have a sense of direction and nobody else does either. There's a specific interaction that Colin Farrell has with a woman on the bus when they're driving to the hunt where she she is desperate to find a partner because she doesn't want to be turned into an animal. So she gets very explicit with him and I do says I do the following things in the bedroom I'm very good at them it can be totally anonymous it's not an issue uh, and I'm fine with these particular things if you want to do them to me because she believes in some capacity that if she interacts with this man in this way then it will solicit the following result so she is falling into the camp of being transactional based off of what it is everyone else thinks that she's supposed to do and then she says, if I don't succeed at this, I'm going to kill myself. And that is just a very interesting, straightforward way to kind of talk about the way in which individuals interact with society. In that there's this statement, I've made it before, you know, I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think that you think I am. And I've mentioned that statement several times. It, throughout this podcast, and I want to bring it up again because that statement is the main thing on display in this film. There really isn't a time in which any of the characters that Colin Farrell interacts with show themselves to be meaningful individuals other than perhaps there's a maid who works at the hotel who, I'm not going to give away her, her storyline verbatim, but she eventually ends up doing things that seem incredibly out of character for her. And ultimately, she is punished for doing those things by the consequences of the world around her that she didn't really have. She never really has any agency in that matter. So she kind of represents, like, the partial actualization of yourself as a self. And ultimately, she suffers for it. In the same way that as Colin Farrell attempts to actualize a self and have feelings and emotions and go through the world with somewhat open eyes, he is ultimately, oh, open eyes. There's a reference in there. And once you watch the movie, I'm sure that that line will mean a lot more to you. But ultimately, he is made to suffer for trying to actualize that in himself as well, which I find to be incredibly interesting and a really profound commentary on what it is that people do when they enter into relationships with each other. They ultimately shut their eyes to the truth in the same way that every character in this film shuts, closes their eyes to the truth. They're completely blind to what is the reality of what's going on around them. They all believe that you'll be turned into an animal when there is a mountain of evidence that indicates otherwise, especially when you take into reference that there's a, a man walking around with a limp because he was attacked by wolves that used to be humans. Again, I'm not buying that people are turned into animals and then that they still attack other people. I don't think that that's the way that it would be if that were the case. So they buy into this idea that you get turned into an animal, but they buy into this idea that it is only good to be with another person. And that is kind of a subtle, pernicious thing in a lot of cultures around the world where like the the apex of your life experience is getting married and having kids. Like the thing that will actualize you as a person is that you've found someone who will spend the rest of their life with you, who will reproduce with you. 
And that plays on like an evolutionary prerogative that we have as individuals, but it's something that has been manipulated into be into something that we believe as a society is the most important aspect of living. And ultimately, in the same way in which every transactional interaction that you have is going to solicit disappointment, the same thing is going to occur when you place all of this value in the actualization of your being being of your being well okay sorry so when the actualization of your being becomes intrinsic to your ability to be actualized by another person who affirms your value and not you affirming your value in yourself then you end up in this place where all of your interactions become transactional you are blind to the truth and you end up just mindlessly pursuing the things that the world tells you to pursue you are that that woman on the bus who says, I will do the following things in order to get you to partner with me. You are that man who manipulates a potential partner into being with him because, or by pretending to have nosebleeds and injuring himself in order to get them. Because it would be worse, and this is just a straight line out of the movie, it would be worse to be turned into an animal than it would to live a lie. And the fact that Lanthimos straightforward says that is a statement about relationships in themselves, about this idea of interactions being transactional, about the way in which our experience will constantly fall short and be disappointing because of our lack of empathy, understanding, and meaningful interactions with other individuals. It will not be what we want it to be, and we will ultimately fall woefully short of what we're looking for because we are in this place of not having a self. We are in this place of blindly moving forward without any true motivation that comes from self-reflection. We just allow the world to impose its will on us without actively thinking about what it is that we're doing because we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, quote-unquote. And that's one of the biggest things that the lobster is talking about. So we're going to keep on talking about these themes in The Lobster, the philosophic themes, some more of the science fiction stuff, and the rest of the plot of the movie. And we're going to do that right after this next quick commercial break. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere where you find podcasts just type gsmc in the search bar is that the lobster is saying about self-actualization and the process of learning to become oneself, the process of self-knowing, and what it is saying ultimately about that in reference to relationships and how you know we rely on those things too much as a crutch. And while a lot of the lobster does focus on specifically the idea of relationships, specifically the idea of human interaction... I think that, in general, it's kind of trying to make a larger statement about society and the types of things in which, or the types of things that society develops based on what is occurring around it. So, because we don't have a ton of backstory on why exactly the world has become the way that it has become in the lobster, the only way that we can kind of reflect on what Lanthimos is trying to say about society in general through the interactions of individuals in that world. And this kind of gets back to this idea of an afterlife being a concept that is known and knowing exactly what that afterlife looks like 
and how it strips individuals of a specific type of meaning depending on the contingencies of that afterlife. So in this movie, the afterlife, quote unquote, if you have failed, a.k.a. died, <laughs> um, which is a whole interesting implication in itself. So I'll get to that right after I talk about this. <laughs> um, the result of that afterlife is that you're stripped of your humanity. But because you know that you're going to be stripped of your humanity, you kind of lose it anyway. You default to this incredibly transactional form of interaction where you're just trying to not necessarily win at anything, but trying to win someone. And you'll lie, cheat, and steal in order to accomplish that task because you don't want to lose your humanity. But in doing the th this thing to get or to avoid losing your humanity, you ultimately have to lose your humanity. There's this kind of this unspoken thing of a catch-22, danged if you do, danged if you don't type of thing going on in this movie. Because in both situations, both social societal situations that Colin Farrell finds himself in, he is forced to act not in accordance to how he feels. And we see pretty clearly that individuals, both Colin Farrell and a couple of other individuals in the hotel, while they try to pretend that they don't have feelings towards things and that they aren't going to interact with things with emotion, while they try to pretend that they can do that, ultimately there's no way to avoid it. And we see that specifically with John C. Riley, where he's punished for committing an act that is banned in the hotel. And we see that in the way that Colin Farrell has to suffer the consequences of certain things throughout the film. So because interactions are transactional, they're not human. They are transactional. And when I first watched this movie, I thought that that was more of a commentary on like maybe the idea of an economic system, which I know is kind of a remote thing to bring into this movie. But the type of world where humans are viewed as a resource to harvest organs from, which is, again, what I think that they're doing when they say they're turning people into animals. They're really just harvesting their organs for use in other things. That type of world is a place where humanity can't really thrive, especially when there's this pervasive lie that if you are not successful at coupling up, you get to live a different life. You get to fail. If you fail at living, then you get to do this other thing in which you have another chance to not fail. Then you lose the temporality and the importance of doing that thing in a meaningful way. Because you can just do that thing, and if you fail, well, I get another chance. And because there's no temporality to it, there's no permanence to it, then you ultimately end up in this place where you lose your humanity. And I thought that it was an, a, a statement on, you know, like a capitalist system at first, because if every interaction is transactional, it's basically the same as exchanging money. And so for me, when I first saw this film, one of the reasons that it messed me up was because it felt like suddenly there was a value that was placed on every interaction that I had with other individuals. And I, I thoroughly believe that that is absolutely an intentional part of this film on Lathamos's part to kind of make you look at the interactions that you have with other individuals and ask yourself, what am I trying to get out of them and what kind of value does it have to me? Because value is something that's intrinsic to existence. We're constantly ascribing value to things. And most frequently, the way in which we default to ascribing value to things is to say, well, how much does society value this thing? Okay, well, if society values it this much, then I'm going to value it this much. And so we act according to that inclination, um rather than according to how we actually feel about the value that something has in the world. And that's a problem because it's what ultimately solicits this process of us losing our humanity. Because we're not... The, the thing that humans do that animals don't do, one of the big things is ascribe value to things, ascribe value to emotions. They ascribe value to 
symbolic representations of things in the world via the mechanism of emotion. Because it's not as if a teddy bear has any kind of intrinsic value in the overall scheme of the world or in the overall scheme of survival. A teddy bear has value to a child because the child has chosen to ascribe value to this thing. And the teddy bear isn't really a teddy bear. The teddy bear is a symbol of something. It, even if it's just a representation in your head, in it, when we ascribe a word to a thing, it's not as if the thing gains thingness because of our giving it a word. The Schrodinger's cat thing or the Schrodinger's cat argument where you know if it's in the box and we can't see it does it really exist it's not true there are things that exist in absolution and our ascribing of a symbol a symbolic representation of them is not what actualizes them into the world a teddy bear is still a group of it's still a, a bit of matter that occupies a space in the world, regardless of whether or not someone has said, that's a teddy bear. The same way in which it now has a certain amount of value when a child says, this is my teddy bear. And so when you're breaking down human interactions with the world to this very basic level of every interaction has a transactional value, then you get stuck in this place, or you're most likely going to be stuck in this place, where interactions don't have value unless they're in reference to something else. And that's just not true. Interaction within the self has a ton of value to it, and that is kind of what a lot of dystopian things are, are uh, commenting on, is that the way, the path to destruction of humanity is the unaware, is the unaware act of living it is the act of not knowing that there is a self that exists somewhere beyond your interactions with the world and the way in which you are frequently caused to avoid engagement with that self that idea of self is not through this simplest like some it's not through complicated means it's through incredibly simple means and that is something that i'm going to talk about right after this last quick commercial break the golden state media concepts travel podcast the show that gives you advice on everything travel we explore places you've always wanted to go as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. discussion by emphasizing the ways in which dystopia is portrayed or i guess achieved and just to get a little bit more universal than just the lobster um to kind of bring in some other references last minute here so i do apologize for that but dystopias are achieved most frequently through the destruction of some aspect of humanity whether that's your human nature or the value of your of biological human life or in the case of the lobster it is the loss of this idea of love the loss of uh emotional connection the way in which those things are achieved and the reason why i think it's super important to talk about science fiction and have it as a viewed as something that is very valuable academically is because it's just incredibly difficult to portray how easy it is to manipulate the masses without the medium of science fiction. If we look at the most famous dystopian works available to us, let's just say 1984, Brave New World, and Fahrenheit 451, because those are 
books that you read in high school, at least in my experience, those are the three most common dystopian novels that you read in high school. Every single one of those mentions all of these tiny little things that were either banned or encouraged or enforced upon individuals in order to solicit this single-mindedness that creates a dystopia. And so the single-mindedness that is achieved in The Lobster is achieved by telling people, well, if you can't become a couple, we're just going to turn you into an animal and you get a second chance to find a mate. Because animals have sex too. So they are able to strip individuals of the need for self-awareness, able to strip individuals for the, of the need to be emotionally engaged with themselves and with others because those interactions don't have, they lack temporality. They're, they're in a way, they're not necessarily eternal, but you, you at your opportunity to become valuable is eternal it's not temporal right there's no temporarity to the fact that you need to find and ascribe value to things you will get another chance to do so as an animal if you fail to do it this time so there's no reason for you to be as invested as you would be if for instance you didn't get another opportunity to find a partner or fall in love or what have you so this is that's the way that you do it in this particular iteration. But just to kind of support my point, one of the main things from Fahrenheit 451 that I've noticed is that, uh, and one of the predictions that Bradbury was true in making a prediction for, is that speed limits would increase. Because when you're driving at 80 miles per hour, you don't have time to reflect on anything. You have to be focused on this unnatural interaction of your vehicle with the road. And so... In Fahrenheit 451, you don't have speed limits, you have speed minimums. And if you are going slower than the speed minimum, they'll pull you over because it means that you might be practicing some form of mindfulness. And the main thing in Fahrenheit 451 is that you're not supposed to read, like that they burn books. Books clearly are a way, and other forms of media, are a way by which to achieve mindfulness and self-awareness and empathy. And the way in which we walk down the road to dystopia blindly, emphasis on blindly because sight is a very big thing in the lobster. Um, I could honestly probably do a whole podcast just on the symbolism, the symbolic representation of and literal representation of the ability to see in the lobster. Uh, but we are only going to do one part podcast podcast on this on this particular movie so i do apologize for not getting to that anyway i'll finish my thought i swear <laughs> so because it these small little interactions with the world are the things that give us the ability to self-actualize they're the things that give us the ability to understand the world around us and to engage with ourselves and engage with others when you take them away you end up in this place where people become single-minded and easy to manipulate like sheep. And I'm sure that there's some symbolism in the selection of the lobster for Feral. Um, a lot of this movie seems to be absurdist in the sense that it's saying something while actively trying to not say something. And that is something that I really love about the movie. Because in its act of trying to not say anything about anything, you get to ascribe meaning to it on a very basic level. And so Lanthimos is at it, the core of the movie forcing you to do the thing that no one in the movie will do. And the reason that the movie is terrifying is because nobody will do this thing. So Lanthimos is forcing you to do this thing in this kind of like... I don't want to say never-ending cycle of, but this cycle of ascribing meaning and to things that don't have intrinsic meaning. So it's just very, very interesting the way and effective the way in which he does this, the way in which he portrays these miscellaneous elements of the film. So back to this, the topic of you know how we get to this point. Um, we get to this point by not consuming things mindfully and not being mindful about our interactions with other individuals. And ultimately, in the same way that mindfulness solicits consequences in the lobster, 
we too are forced to experience consequences of mindfulness and descriptions of value to things in the world around us because when we decide for ourselves what kind of value things hold it means that we're ascribing that to our, via our own individual self and that we're probably not going to ascribe meaning to that thing in the same way that everybody else in society is going to ascribe meaning to that thing and that ultimately is going to alienate us because when there's this transactional expectation when it comes to interacting with other human beings, the expectation is that we're both going to come to the same conclusion because we, divide, we desire congruity most, more frequently than not. It's not very often that you find people who are self-actualized who are hopeful that other people will think the same way that they do. We mindlessly pursue this idea of being unified in our thought processes. We want everyone to be single-minded because we're intrinsically social creatures and if you look at the animal kingdom then the creatures that are not single-minded are the ones that will more frequently than not die and fail to reproduce and so at its core we being animals ourselves either evolved or were designed to act on those same instincts and when we allow ourselves to go to this basal this basic instinctual level of interaction with the world where we're not ascribing value to things based off of our own individual conclusions you get to this place where you are mindless and you are just a cog in a wheel of a machine that does not care about you the individuals who are harvesting body parts they don't care about the individuals who are being turned into, quote-unquote, turned into animals. They have no vested interest in them. And because they have no vested interest in them, even the people who are doing it, the people who run the hotel, they have no vested interest in each other. They have no vested interest in the well-being of other individuals. And so the very core of what makes someone human, the ability to relate to other humans, is lost. And... That, I think, is the biggest thing that the lobster is trying to say, is that when you are not self-aware, when you are not acknowledging the sinister truth of the way in which society tells us that we're supposed to interact with each other, when you don't acknowledge that, you end up in a place where ultimately you aren't really human. You are just a mindless cog that continues to turn in this wheel and that it is painful and difficult to break free of that system. And I've mentioned this idea of like traumas and hurt and pain before. Um, just, I think the biggest thing in this movie is that the fear of rejection, the fear of outsideness or ostracization is more powerful or can be more powerful than the desire to self-actualize, the desire to do something truly good and meaningful for yourself or for another individual. And because it's so easy for us to become mindless in that way, because it's so subconscious, when we allow that to happen, then we are stripped of the thing that makes us human. And that thing that makes us truly human is the alien thing in the lobster, and that is love. The thing that gives us the real capacity to evolve and to become better versions of ourselves is love. And that starts from within. So the lobster ultimately is in its own way this incredibly cathartic journey to the conclusion of love is the only way by which we can continue to be mindful human beings. And that is part of why, it's a major part of why I love the film so much. And it's also kind of funny that that's the conclusion that I think ultimately needs to be drawn from this film because the way by which you get there is not the way that you're going to be expecting to get there. And if you've seen this film, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And when you watch it, which I highly recommend that you do, I think that you'll also be pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised that that is a similar conclusion that you'll probably draw from it. But that's where we're going to end today's podcast. Uh, so if you draw different conclusions, mention them in a review, leave some comments. Uh, would love to get your feedback on things. Like I said, 
Keep your ears open for potentially an email address for you guys to email questions into. I'd love to do an episode where I answer some of your questions if any of you have them, assuming I have anyone that even listens to this through the full thing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, at us on Twitter. Definitely leave your comments about this movie, The Lobster. It is streaming on Netflix. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will be back on Sunday to talk about the second chapter of Hyperion, or at least the next uh, tale in Hyperion. So have a great day, everybody. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program